have Dr. Rosie Kuhn from Orcas Island um, coming in, uh, into our living room via Google Hangout. Rosie, thanks for joining us. You're welcome, my pleasure. Yeah, this is really exciting. Uh, Rosie and I met at the ASSIST conference last fall in Dallas. And uh, when I found her, um, I think we both felt like we had found uh, a kindred spirit and uh, she's been a huge influence in my life as a spiritual coach. And I'm just so grateful to get to introduce her to our Lovett community. And I'm not gonna do too much more introduction, Rosie, because I wanna give you the whole hour. Uh, what I do want everybody to know about you is that you're not just an amazing transformational and spiritual life coach. You've been in the transformational field for over 30 years. You taught at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology for 10 years. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. He has a very large body of work. I would recommend everyone to go to the paradigmshifts.com. Is it shifts with an S or just a singular shift? S with a, a yes, plural, if you will. Plural. Yes. yes. Okay. yes. Paradigmshifts.com to take a look at her very extensive body of work. And without further ado, Rosie, welcome to the Hope Potluck. Yay! Yay. <laughs> wanting to come to Lubbock to the potluck for uh, as long as I've known Elizabeth so I'm actually here at least virtually so it's nice to be with you guys um, so a little bit of introduction uh, I grew up in Michigan I grew up in uh, outside Detroit in a family of nine I was sixth of nine in a alcoholic family uh, pretty normal typical that way uh, with plans to get married and have kids and live happily ever after. That was my plan. Uh, however, I um, got divorced quite early and uh, my children ended up living with their dad because he had stability and support and financial stuff that I didn't have. So even at 28, my whole world just shifted up and over from the normal what I thought to something else. And uh, so from there, long story, Nova Scotia for 10 years working in the field of addictions uh, crossing the Atlantic Ocean on a 93-foot schooner where I had my first transformational experience. Uh, realized that I wanted to further my education and look at how to integrate the spirituality that I realized through working with people in recovery and how to integrate that into therapy because the therapeutic field uh, for me is uh, does not have enough uh, spiritual orientation in, in what's... Um, what's provided and support uh, through therapy. So I went to the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto, California. It's now Sophia University. And I studied transpersonal psychology, did my uh, dissertation on sailing as a transformational experience. Then I found life coaching, where for me, uh, life coaching is really about leaps of faith. It's really about um, taking people, taking individuals from where they are currently to where they want to go, which sometimes takes a step in faith or leap in faith or a hop in faith. So, so I use um, mostly coaching uh, to, to do my work. Uh, and uh, lately it's been an integration of really uh, a lot of spirituality and, and, um, and coaching. Uh, and so I am now currently uh, the, uh, on the board of the assist group. You guys all know with the assist group. And I also train people in the ASSIST uh, organization to be life and spiritual coaches. So, uh, and we do a certification program. So that's sort of the general me-ness. I've written a number of books, which you guys can see online if you go to my, my website. This is the latest one. There's another one coming. This is called Me, M-E, which stands for Miraculous Existence. And it's 101 indispensable insights I didn't get in therapy. <laughs> and this title came when I was in the midst of, uh, I, for the past five years, I've been in the midst of a spiritual immersion process, which I'm going to talk about shortly. And I was out on my driveway. I've, I live on, an, uh, on Orcas Island, as Elizabeth said, and I live on 10 acres, sort of in the woods. And I was having this moment where this human experience was happening to me and I'm going, I didn't get this in therapy. Like, 
you know, this is one thing that's, there's so much we don't get in therapy because it's about being human and spiritual beings. And so that's how I came up with the title and then the book unfolded from there. So um, I'll tell you more about my books later if you're, if you want. Uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, and Elizabeth can, can work those through as we go. So I want to start the actual talk with this particular uh, quotation, which is from the Course in Miracles. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Course in Miracles, but it's been one of my main Bibles for the past 30 years. This quote says, lack implies that you would be better off in a state somehow different from the one you are in. Lack implies that you would be better off in a state somehow different from the one you are in. So that particular sentence uh, was a, a, a game changer for me because I realized many, many years ago that I was constantly in a state of lack. There wasn't enough love from my marriage or my friends or my children. There wasn't enough money from my job or my careers. There wasn't enough. Um, I live in a 25 foot uh, trailer. I live in a 25 foot travel trailer here up on Orcas Island and I love it. But at first I didn't, I was pretty mad about it, but it worked. So it was a lack of space and a lack of um, lots of things. When I realized that lack implies there's something missing, then I had to start looking at what are my spiritual truths? What are my spiritual orientations that I speak to others, that I talk, that I train others to listen to or support and coach them to live in their spiritual selves. And what elements of, of myself am I talking about, but not actually practicing? So five years ago, I was, uh, I had been working at ITP at the Institute uh, training coaches and I got a call calling as it were spiritual calling to do, to leave that program and do something else. And it took me about two years to get to the point where I could actually leave that program and move in the, in the direction of my trajectory. And uh, so the program ended on September 15th, 2010. And I came back to Orcas Island on, 2000, on September 16th. And the next day I sat by the phone and waited for it to ring because we know that if spirit is calling you to do your work in the world, you're going to get the call right away, right? We know that, right? Yeah. Well, I sat by the phone and nothing happened. And so my, my sense is the trajectory was going to take me in the direction of up and out and in the universe and expansive. But I forgot that the universe actually goes down and in. And uh, so that was the, the point where I realized that uh, I had made a big choice and I continued to believe in that choice to follow a calling. But when you make those kinds of choices, you have to be in them for a while. It's not like you can say, yes, I'm making that call. Uh, following the calling and then all of a sudden everything's going to magically appear like we think or hope it will. So for the past almost five years now, I have been in this process of spiritual immersion and I've in the process of writing a book, I've written quite a few books during that this time, but uh, the, the book on spiritual immersion is still in process. But for me, the distinction, I know Elizabeth talks about spiritual emergence. Uh, and for me, if we're going to live, if we choose to, and speak about living a spiritual life, we actually have to walk our talk. We actually have to step into the experience, the direct experience of being uh, with our choices, with our spiritual choices, if you will. Uh, and, and it creates a lot of catastrophes, if you will, to do that because as we have our spiritual orientation, you each have your own set of beliefs and values. We also have this thing called the consensus view of reality that says, if you quit your job, you're going to be a silly, stupid person because you no longer have any income and you aren't going to be able to afford your mortgage or your rent. Like all of these things in our consensus reality that says, what an idiot. I shouldn't have left my job. But from the spiritual perspective, we say, 
hey, the universe is abundant. The universe is full potentiality. The uni universe is oneness. I am source as is what, you know, the world. I'm universal source of all that is. I'm full potentiality. That means I have access to everything possible. And so do you. However, as long as I can say I am, I have access to all that possibility. It's unlimited. And then my fear sense comes in. My fear-based thinking comes in and goes, yes, but what about the mortgage? What about your taxes? What about, and it starts to shift me back into my, my fear as opposed to my absolute knowing, my absolute truth of my universal potentiality. So for me, the distinction is I decided to take the journey of, of living in my absolute spiritual truth in order to um, fulfill my potentiality in the world. If I listen to my fears, if I listen to the consensus view of reality, then I'm staying within a consensus view of reality, which is not necessarily the full potentiality of the universe. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Yeah, good. Just shaking your head. <laughs> so the spiritual immersion is stepping into that uh, moment by moment. It's stepping into this is what I this is my experience. Some of you are experiencers of near death experiences or out of body or trans transformational experiences. You've had those experiences and you know that to be true. And we go, yes, that's true, but, and then we shift out of that as opposed to staying in the, yes, this is true. And being with the, that as our orientation. So the spiritual immersion part is the willingness to keep stepping into, yes, this is what's true. Yes, this is what we say. Yes, this is what we do in, in, in a spiritual context. And yes, I'm going to stay here in this moment, no matter how uncomfortable, how scary, how emotional it feels i'm going to stay here in this moment and in a sense immerse myself in this direct experience of my humanness and my spiritness does that make sense so it's in a sense for those of you who have do dove or uh, i guess is when you when you go swimming and you dive into a lake and you dive and you and you plunge you take the plunge and you're down so far and then you start to emerge and you start coming up. So you can't come up in a sense until you go in. And so that's my focus and my intention is to support people in that process of, of immersing themselves in the direct experience of who you are in this human experience, who you are as the spiritual being and in a sense, the investigation and the exploration, the adventure of, of finding you and knowing you. And then the emergence part is how you, ex how you express that in the world, how you expand into the world with that. Does that make sense? Yes. So any questions or thoughts about that? Uh, Elizabeth, can we do that? Um, we've got a couple of viewers, and if they want to post their questions up in the Q&A, they can, or if anybody in the room wants to come up and either visit face-to-face -face or just ask a question, whatever you prefer. Or they could say it to you, and you can say it to me. Okay. So, any thoughts or any ideas so far, or um, comments, or? I did the same thing. I quit my job in the oil field because it wasn't good for my soul, even though I was making a lot of money, went back to school, and now I'm did you hear her rosie uh, i heard that uh that she quit her job in the oil field or in the oil fields and is spending more time with her daughter I think, but that's yeah. yeah yeah and she made a lot of money in the oil field but she gave it up and she went back to school and now she's playing the banjo is oh, that fun, fun, fun. and doing skin care yeah and being with her daughter so she took that initial plunge by letting go of the traditional and the, the big money. Yes. It's a, it's the, the, the challenge is, is like, what is the real, the real, your, your absolute truth in a sense that, you know what I, I, 
I started a little group like you guys have Hope uh, in Lubbock and I have a little group here we call, um, I, I did a talk um, and it was really um, Elizabeth who inspired me. I did a talk at the library here on Orcas and it was, I, am I crazy or have I just had a spiritually transformative experience? Which, which I borrowed from Rosie. We did our first um, Am I Crazy group separately from the potluck this last weekend. Oh, good, good, good. good. Um, and so now I forgot why I brought that up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. No, but you started a potluck there. I started the potluck there, and I can't remember why I said that. So we'll go on. <laughs> I'll, I'll met at the library. I was going to say uh, something about the "Am I crazy?" We, we started talking about the "Am I crazy?" We called it the "Am I crazy?" potluck because nobody's come up with a better name yet. But <laughs> the the element of what is the absolute truth? That, you know, it's like you guys. That, that was my point. Is you guys come together once once a month and and talk about in a sense some spiritual tenets and spiritual orientations and truths for you and what's the degree to which you live into that every day of your life every moment of your life if you will and the challenge with this process is it, the emergence process is that um, you're choosing to take the steps every day you're choosing um, to look at and notice Here's how I've been operating. Here's my boss has just come in the room. I've got anxiety. You know, the boss comes in, I get triggered. And, and it's like, oh, now I got anxiety. It's like how I operate usually with that anxiety perhaps is to withdraw, withhold, or look busy. But if I'm living in my spiritual truth, my absolute truth of who I am, and, uh, and I allow myself to see myself as God sees me, well, now how do I? How do I operate when the boss comes in the room? Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to see myself differently? <laughs> to see myself from the fear-based consensus view of reality. Every moment we're thinking like 400,000 thoughts that it, it make us or create the reality that we're, 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 we're living. And the, the element here is for, for me is that we either get hit upside the head with a two by four from spirit. We uh, have near death experiences or other transformative experiences which show us there's something different or, or and or we choose to step into the relationship with our spirit one moment at a time. And my, my work as a, as a transformational coach is to empower people to take those steps for themselves in service to what, what it is they're wanting. So this, the, um, how many of you, if you would raise your hand, have been are, are experiencers of spiritually transformative experiences? Let me count. Okay, hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Of about 35. Okay, excellent. So you guys already know that stuff, this stuff of this um, element of our spiritual self that is just is, is the isness of that. And how how do you integrate that? How do you allow yourself to live that every moment of the day? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah. Anybody want to share? Do you want to come up here so that they can hear you? Um, hello. Hi. Where do I, where do I get right here? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Hold on just a second. You don't have to see her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think they, most of these guys know. I had, I had kind of the mother of all spiritual emergencies. You know, flew off the planet for several years. And, um, you know, they kind of didn't work. And it's like Elizabeth, <laughs> like Elizabeth told me one time, I was studying the Course in Miracles um, one day, and I was gonna write, uh, sending the Calvary a lot, and instead all I wrote, uh, something took came over me and wrote, all I wanna do is wake up and not reincarnate anymore. 
And I called Elizabeth and she said, oh, honey, honey, that's when your 3D world falls apart. But, uh, and it did, it fell apart, but I'm rebuilding it. And we bought a beautiful old, like 8,500 square foot church. Um, and so what I'm doing, uh, one reason I moved out there was to be with God through the sky, right? Nature. And uh, unfortunately, the mosquitoes have come over. <laughs> so at night, I'm like, God, what do I do? How am I supposed to connect with you? And really, just like you said, I heard, go in there and scrape the floor. Like Pat said today, you know, it's the chopping wood carrying water Buddhist thing. You know, just, just one moment at a time, like you said. And these guys would all say, yes, I have come way back down and more grounded. And, um, you know, I know what you said. Just I, I don't always have time to, to study the course. I also study the course. But it doesn't really matter. It's okay. I'm just walking out this experience, like you said, uh, one moment at a time, trying to be loved, you know? And yeah. I think I've done an incredible job compared to where I was like three years ago. <laughs> Congratulations. Excellent. Yeah. The, um, the, the part that's a, so important is that there, it's, it's like what you were saying, is there's a, there has to be a commitment, which is very similar. With the commitment, you can have dedication. With that dedication, you begin to get disciplined and you begin to exercise and practice in alignment with, uh, with what you say is true. And we have this commitment to God. We have this commitment to do divine work. We have commitment to be the fullest capacity of ourselves. And at the same time, we have this other commitment, which says, I don't want to get um, broke. I don't want to get lost. I don't want to become homeless. I don't want to become a a alone and isolated and all that scary stuff. So though we have a commitment to our divine and highest self and making our highest contribution we also have this element this part that says and i don't want to die of loneliness and starvation but we have to decide this is a, a choice point most of us have a live at this choice point which keeps us like okay i'll i will make the changes towards uh, being a greater developed person and then the next day it's like well i don't think so you know i think i'll go so in that point of the choice point, we can really sit. Sometimes I have to really sit on my hands and say, look, what is it that I really believe? And if I say I really believe in the divine, first of all, that is and my potentiality in that, then I want to I want to make my next choices based on that reality. Even though there's part of me that says, yeah, but you might die. You've died 100,000 deaths before you, you, you know, you might die this time. So we know that in our past lives, if, if you believe in, trans, um, in past lives and reincarnation, that we've died every time. And most of those have made maybe not very happy times. So that part keeps telling me, hey, you might die. But the, the fact of the matter is, and I can now say this to myself quite easily, it's like, I'm going to die anyway. So I can die living in my fullest absolute truth, or I can die being afraid of living in my absolute truth. And this takes place for me a moment to moment. Sometimes my days are just full of moment to moment um, uh, <clears throat> discernments of what is my truth? What's the most important thing for me here? And um, basically I can, I can decide in service to um, my absolute truth, this oneness source of all that is, potentiality, I lack nothing. And when I can do that, I can then take the next step today in this, not take the next step, but like you were saying, go scrape walls, go clean windows, go water the plants, go for the walk with the dog, something small. It's, it's incremental steps and not the big late faith leaping muscles that, that we think have to take place. And it's the, it's for me that the, I think the point that I want to um, make is just um, what it takes to live each moment 
the 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 amount of uh, sp what I call spiritual intelligence. I'm not the only one that calls it spiritual intelligence, but we we're so much more smart and so much more intelligent than than what we use in our in our life in our daily life. So much more brilliance, and I find this every time I sit with people is like, oh my God, there there's a lot of brilliance in this world, but generally we act pretty stupid, and we act stupid <laughs> because we're attached to we are attached to other people liking us we're attached to being loved we're attached to security stability and safety but we have to decide again well am i attached to that which is fear-based or am i attached to uh thinking in in terms of my divine truth what i know to what i tell people all the time about truth and another element is really important is the element of self-trust and in a sense that i i noticed i noticed that like three years into this process if not i think four years actually into this process of spiritual immersion that i didn't trust myself i live here i'm 60 i'm 63 so 62 years that I've lived and lived successfully, you know, like I'm sitting here talking to you and I've got PhD and blah, blah, blah. And this element has now, I've never asked myself that question. To what degree do I trust myself that I can actually accomplish what I set out to do? I mean, imagine that. <laughs> really, I mean, imagine yourself, it's like, can you, to what degree do you trust yourself to actually be able to fill what you set out to do? Any thoughts about that? Any comments or questions about that? Somebody coming over. Okay, great. Ah, I can keep my fat head out of the light. And tell, uh, me, tell me your name, please. You look familiar. Yes, we met at the ASSIST conference last year. I'm Sarah Stone. Hi, Sarah. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, too. I'm a, a licensed professional counselor here in Texas, so I was on a slightly different track at the conference, but we did meet. Um, trusting yourself is an interesting thing for me. I find myself um, sort of doing this flip flop and I think I'm trusting myself and what I realize I'm, I'm doing is, is trying to trust myself to a process of meeting societal expectations. Yes. And then I'll have a brief awakening of, no, wait a minute, this doesn't fit. And then I'll try to go the other way and make things happen spiritually, yes. which doesn't work either. <laughs> but, you know, waiting for that phone call that was supposed to come five minutes ago. Yes. Um, or five years ago. <laughs> yeah, five years ago. Yeah, um, about those late in life graduate programs. Yes. Uh, so I'm in an interesting place right now where I'm just going back and, and doing both some rediscovery and new discovery of myself separate from what it is I think I was supposed to be doing. Um, and I know for me, part of that has been about sort of an unwinding of the academic process and getting out of my left brain. Yes. Um, and, and so if you could speak a little bit more to that, that self-trusting, but also being in the world and not of it, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm particularly interested because where I am right now, even though I really value my education and being a licensed professional counselor, I'm, I am discovering that in order for me to do a lot of the work I want to do, I may have to sort of set that to the side a little bit and become more of the coach and, and begin to use some of that language, even though I'm relying a lot on the same knowledge and theories and psychology, et cetera. So it's, it's an interesting place of un unwinding and discovery. Beautiful. So. Thank you, Sarah. So uh, David Hawkins talks about this. I know some of you are, are familiar with David Hawkins' work. And um, he basically says that our intellect, our mental, mentalizations are pretty limited in how they actually contribute to our evolution in consciousness that our consciousness doesn't necessarily occur in our mentations. 
they occur in our in our hearts in our embodied experience our vibrational resonance and all of that so it's only in the direct experience of what it is that we're wanting or what it is that that is the direct experience of what is is where uh life happens that's where we connect with our own experience our own sense not it's like it's where we live it's where we meet ourselves in this moment in the direct experience and you know i can say oh well read my books you know and but your what's in books will only hopefully inspire you to take the plunge into into a specific um and direct experience with yourself does that make sense that our thinking is really based pretty much on the consensus view of reality and will not support you because it's mainly what we call ego based it's mainly ego based and connected to the defaults of our consensus view of reality and it isn't connected necessarily to um you know to our heart and to our our humanness and to our spiritual self uh one of the things that it, um in like Elizabeth said at the um, at my website, the Paradigm Shifts, I have lots and lots of, of information there, blogs, um, all kinds of things. And again, as I, when I trip into my mind, I just did it again. I tripped into my mind and I forgot what I was going to tell you, sort of intuitively. So it's gone again. But um, that that ability to uh, step into the experience and live in faith, if you will, that sense of who am i now in this moment we're constantly looking for something to a handhold of what's going to make me feel safe while i'm in this experience of letting go you know what i'm talking about it's like i don't i'm going to let go but i want to hold on to something so that when i let go it's not going to be quite so scary yeah. but we can't have the experience of letting go without letting go and the letting go isn't you know this it can be the abyssness as as one of my clients says since it feels like the abyssness but it's an abyss business of a moment as you change your <coughs> change your orientation from mental to to something else and the something else is who you are um <clears throat> i um one of the things I've put together is, is a, a model called the domains of awareness. And it's a, it looks like a, a bullseye, it looks like a target, you know, with a circle and a circle and a circle. And the outer circle is basically who we are as spiritual beings, the universal source of all that is, the full potentiality, limitlessness. That's who we are always, as the energetic, vibrational resonance of the universe. And as that we choose to come in to in a sense to the next circle in which is our domain of humanness we choose to be spiritual beings within this form and we call humanness and our humanness is only our it's only states of being the beingness is where we live right we live in our human beingness our ego or our choice maker wants us to think that we live in the personality and the doing and the uh, making it happen. But actually our being, our humanness is a being, a state of being. It's a state of being um, happy, a state of being excited, a state of being anxious, a state of being beauty, creativity, inspiration. These are all states of being. And we forget this part. This is so much a part of the the spiritual immersion process because we're seeing who we are in this human experience, not just as spirit beings, you know, many of you who raised your hand know who you are as the spirit being, but who are you being spirit in this human experience? And that exploration is a, in the moment, no handholds, no parachutes kind of experience. You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Many of you do. It's nice to see your smiles, you guys. So that that willingness to step, just step into an unknown experience and let go of what it should be or what you should have, what should be in place, 
or I should be further along, I should be all those things, let go of those and just be in the moment. That's the direct experience that becomes your guide for the next experience. Does that make sense? Yes. So every one of us who ha who is choosing to leave something where there's stability and security and safety, uh, whether it's um, the health and well-being or marriages or families or jobs or whatever it is that has given us a, that sense of stability and we're in the process of considering leaving that for something else, it puts us in that in that opportunity to explore that state of being who I am uh, on my egoic self, who I always wanted to be, who I, you know, I wanted to be a mom, I wanted to be married forever and live happily ever after and live in a big house and all that kind of stuff. It's not my life. I live in a trailer and, you know, all kinds of funny things that just had no idea that that's what I was going to be doing. I wrote this book. Um, this is called The Unholy Path of a Reluctant Adventurer. And that's me as a, a, my first communion. Um, and, and so I wrote down all of this, the elements of life that wasn't supposed to happen to me. I was, I was supposed to have the safety, security, and stability of a normal all American girl kind of life. And it's not the path. And very few of us actually have that path though we try really hard to make it happen. It sometimes just doesn't happen that way. And, um, you know, our physical health or our illnesses and our disease are channels for well-being. Uh, those of you who have had ex spiritually transformative experience, those are channels of well to move into well-being and healing. There's so many ways that we've chosen to, to grow and develop ourselves. And they're just different, unique, paths. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. So um, any any questions? I'm, I'm all over the map here. Um, any questions in terms of anything? Well, Rosie, can you see the Q&A on the side of the screen? Can you see that on your computer? Uh, Q&A, yes. Okay, there's something there, but um, because I've got you up on a projector, I can only see half of it. I'm not quite sure if it's a question or a statement that somebody's sharing. Can you it, says, uh, it says, it's from Nicole Mix. She says, for me, it has been a constant showing up for myself in complete honesty with how I am. What has helped me has been a complete surrendering and devotional commitment to walking the talk, as you say. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Thank you for being here. Nicole's in Ohio. Oh, wow, super. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah. The, um, you know, again, uh, the, the practice of walking our talk, it's, you know, some of these things are, it's like, it makes sense at the time, but to actually practice it um, moment by moment is, is a real challenge because we have to stay awake. We have to uh, be mindful of those triggers that take us in a direction other than in, in towards our highest um, evolved self. So, um, I have this commitment to walk my talk and I'm doing pretty good, but then I get a, a moment of anxiety and that anxiety, and this happens to all of us in the recovery field, they call it restless, irritable discontent. We have a moment of restless, irritable discontent and it triggers us to a, a behavior that takes us to security, stability, and safety. You know, maybe I'll go eat a pizza. That's a good thing to do. Or, um, uh, go and watch a movie or play games or do something that distracts me in that moment from what just triggered the anxiety, what tr just triggered that emotion. And that emotional self is much younger than, than who we are in our most, most likely our chronological age. And we tend to follow that emotion, that anxiety or the worry or the fret or the, the fear. Uh, we follow that as a, a guide as opposed to, wait a second, Where's that fear coming from? We know in the divine world of oneness, there is no fear. There's no reason to fear. And so if we believe and trust and say, yes, I'm going to, I believe that's true. Then in those moments where I start to feel a panic or a, an anxiety or an element of something other than the fulfillment, fulfillment of my sense of grace, we'll say, that's a moment to, 
to step into awareness and, and check myself. What just caused that? What just created that moment? What was a belief or thought that came up that shifted me from grace, we'll say, to fear? And, you know, I, I've been, this has been an, uh, an ongoing practice for a long time, but the last five years, as I was saying, has been where I've really immersed myself in this practice. But it's a daily practice and, you know, I get better at it. So, so my sta state of grace, we'll say, is, is more sustainable, but I'm not there 24-7. I'm there a lot more than I used to be. Uh, but I can catch myself when I feel um, something that causes the restless, irritable discontent. And I can begin to uh, question in that moment, what's causing that? Because we're either in the state of grace or we're con concerned about something that we're lacking, right? Yeah. Being willing to just stay there and be uncomfortable until you discover what you put. That's right. Uh, our, our, or our consensus of view of reality says I shouldn't be uncomfortable. I should, you know, I shouldn't be uncomfortable. I shouldn't feel my isolation, my, my, my fears of, or, or horrificness. I, I shouldn't feel those things. I shouldn't feel um, just fear. I should, I should, there should be something that makes me feel better. And so I'm going to go, you know, get some medication or I'm going to go someplace and get something. And as soon as I'm trying to get something outside myself externally, then I'm missing what I'm supposed to get from myself. Does that make sense? And um, having the support, you guys have this incredible support system and you've got um, uh, coaches and other other people that can be spiritual guides that can be supportive when you need somebody that's going to hold you accountable to yourself in a sense that um, the, the idea that we're thinking partners for each other allows us to think um, clearly about what it is I'm trying to get and what's not here in the moment since I if I if I believe I lack something in this moment then I'm afraid. If I have a thinking partner, if I can't do it with myself, getting a thinking partner or support, which you guys are all for yourself, and say, hey, in this moment, I am lack. I feel like I lack something. Um, yeah. Years ago, in a workshop, something was said that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's coming up again today about how we should on ourselves all the time. Mm -hmm. And so if I ever see myself going into, oh, I should do this or that person should be, should, 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 I realize I'm shooting. Yes. And uh, I like to try to use the word could rather than should. Yeah. And try to just take that out of my vocabulary because it can really get me into trouble. That's a great, it's a great, a great thing. And even when we start to should, when we hear ourselves say, I should, <clears throat> saying what's, what element of me thinks I should? Is it fear-based or is it what I say essence-based? Is that fear-based, is that should come from the consensus view of reality that I should be according to somebody who made that up? Or who am I in my essential being? Who am I? What, what is it that that's the fullest desire within me? I, uh, I had this moment once where I asked the question, um, am I worthy of my own desire? Am I worthy of my own desire? And that was like a big kick in the head because the answer was no, I'm not. I wasn't living into the fulfillment of my own desire because there was this element of I'm not worthy of it. And that, that, those kinds of elements that come into your awareness, when you can be more mindful of it, then you start to have an opportunity to change those thoughts. We can't change anything that we are not aware of. And that's why this uh, sort of the mindfulness elements or the coaching where there's questions that help you come cultivate awareness for yourself, then allows you to make choices more consciously. And you can do this with yourself to a larger degree by just being mindful of 
oh, I just had a feeling that I didn't like. What, where did that come from? And being to ask your, able to ask yourself in such a way that you can answer that question, not just ask it rhetorically, but ask it and answer it for yourself. What is it? What's the belief that I have, the interpretation that had me, that had triggered that, exp that experience, that moment of whatever it was. So uh, the, the should is just an indication of, oh, I, I'm attempting to come, I'm attempting to get safety, security, and stability as opposed to allowing something else to, to come forth through. Uh, one of the elements that I found really helpful too is that if I'm trying to, if I'm doing what I'm doing to get something, that's an indication that I'm not sort of in my more spiritual self. I'm in my more consensus view self. Does that make sense? If I, if I lack nothing, then there's nothing for me to get because I have it all. But as soon as I start to get something, that's an indication like, oh, I have a feeling like something's missing here. What is that? And I can start to look at that. And you and all of us do can do this. All of us can do this. Have that opportunity to just sit and stop and listen, and and uh, engage because this is where you get to engage with yourself and learn who you are inside this experience of your humanness. And you can engage in such a way that you can see the patterns that you've created through the process of just being you and how, how choices have been made, how you've made choices in the past and can choose to make different path choices um, just by being aware of this process. And it, it gets to be more and more fun and sometimes more and more uncomfortable at the same time because we're, we're, we're working on not only the emotional but this energetic vibrational re resonance and the element that a lot of people have problems with, the discomfort, is that we have this cellular memory that's been storing uh, emotions, energy for lifetimes. And so as you're doing this work, you may feel really uncomfortable. You may feel like you've got the flu. You might just want to sleep. You might feel very emotional. That's normal. That's normal uh, evolution of consciousness where our consensus view says you're sick, you're crazy, you must, you got to go get some psychiatric help. The spiritual element is that's normal because you're a human being having a spiritual experience, a vibrational experience. And the more that you can have, um, a, have, um, have books that have books and people and or recordings or whatever that, that support you through that process, then you can realize the normalness of that. Um, and the uh, insanity of what we've considered to be normal. Um, so much of what you talked about has to do with the extension of a larger awareness of what we are and what's available to Very often, we will take an impact when we have whatever in our consciousness down to that fear base or whatever. But so much of being able to live a larger has to do with living with a larger consciousness, expanding our consciousness, raising our vibration, expanding the focus so that that small contracted place can be a consciousness. More often. That takes a lot of work to do that when you're in the Yeah. You know, it's like um so I didn't catch all that I that you said, Patrick, but I think I got the gist of it. And it's like um what were what I'm encouraging is in a sense this is our this is like yoga like going to yoga and you've got these asanas where like um downward facing dog where you've got you're down in sort of this position and it's uncomfortable 
and you know i get pissed off i get angry in, in downward facing dog because i hate it i hate it but the value of being in downward facing dog is in the experience of noticing all of that discomfort and allowing myself to stretch in such a way that i'm stretching those muscles that have been tight and rigid and inflexible and limiting so that that downward facing dog might be i need to be with my anxiety uh, you know my anxiety keeps running me i need to sit with my anxiety i need to sit with somebody so i can sit with my anxiety or my grief i've lost i lost a parent a while ago and i've not allowed myself to sit with the grief of that those are the asanas that we're talking about those are the moments of of being in the discomfort of your humanness not trying to make it any different not trying to make it something because making it is trying to get something but the, in a sense the reward is in the, in the ability to be in the experience in the for me to be in a downward facing dog and allow myself to relax into it without my anger and frustration and i don't want it different that's the moment that is the, the reward of of the exercise so uh, the, another element of this work in spiritual immersion is we're not trying to get something other than the experience of the fullness of your capacity to be you. The fullness of the capacity to be you. That's, that's what we're after. And in that process, the phenomenal way that the universe meets you and supports you is just outrageous. Many of you guys already know that, but it's, it's delightful to, to, to think that you, you, you're having this experience of going in and all of a sudden the emergence begins to happen, the extension, the expansion, your creativity, your um, connection to the world shifts in ways that are effortless. And it's really fun and a lot of work. Yeah. Rosie, um, so what I'm hearing you saying, this is Elizabeth, is as we sit with those uncomfortable areas of us and we become aware of them, accept them for what they are, let them talk to us or teach us what it is we need to know, um, we're dissolving the block to the larger consciousness, the larger business of us, and we gain more access to that creativity, and yes. et cetera. Is that right? That's right. Okay. One of the things I love about David Hawkins, oh my God, my brain just did it again. See? <laughs> oh, is what he says is there's nothing to do but stop doing what doesn't work. <laughs> so I, I have an anxiety attack, and all of this, you know, I want to go do something. It's like, stop, it didn't work. I, I like to eat. It's like stop. That doesn't work. It doesn't. It doesn't work to um, to heal the, the what's the source of that anxiety or whatever it is. Just stop. Stop doing that. And I'm saying this to myself. And I have to. I have to comfort myself. You can't. I'm, I have to comfort myself while I'm doing that because, you know, I'm I'm letting go of, of a way of being that has been able to help me cover up myself my, my emotional self or my my vulnerabilities and now i'm saying stop we're not going to do what doesn't work that's that's all we're going to do in service only to in service to what we say we want only in service to say in in service to what we say we are nothing more okay and as a coach the first question i ask and i ask it probably more times than my clients really want to hear it what is it you want? What is it you want that that you wanted enough that you're willing to, to do some of these exercises that strengthen these muscles and allows for sustainability of our immersion, emergence, and then sustainability of our fullest expression? What is it that you want that you're willing to practice something different? Nothing more. You don't have to do it to get anything, but just what you want. So um, let's see, we're, we've got about five minutes left. Is that right? 
Yeah, and I think there's something, another question up on the screen, I think. So Nicole wrote again, how do we withdraw attachment from the external outcome from what we are internally, internally cultivating? Even in, if I begin to abundantly flow from within to without, I seem to either be seeing or looking outside my, of me for the results of my spiritual work. Excellent. Because um, we're still, that's, it's like we have this uh, element of our spirit uh, ego, which thinks it's spiritual. So it's like, ah, I've, I've made this, this happen, or I've, this has happened to me. So that means I'm spiritually doing the right work. Um, and it's really, uh, it's, it's very engaging. It's very seductive to look outside ourselves uh, and get attached to, oh, aren't I great because I've uh, cultivated, you know, this. Uh, as opposed to the uh, staying within and going, ah, this is a delightful moment. So even cultivating this opportunity to sit with you all in Lubbock, Texas, it's a fulfillment of mine, of a desire to connect and engage with you guys and be with you. And at the same time, it's really about my own fulfillment in that because it's all about me. Uh, it's all about you. Uh, but it's... <laughs> Say that again. I missed it. There's really only one of us here. Oh, there's only one of you here. <laughs> That's great. That's beautiful. So yeah, so that, that when we start to look outside ourselves, we can say, oh, there's an indicator. So for instance, uh, about a year ago, I noticed that the quality of people that were coming into my life as friends, the quality of people that were coming in as uh, clients and connections, it was very different than what I had been attracting before then. So I can get all uppity by saying, wow, aren't I special that I'm you know, in, now attracting more amazing people? Or I can say, wow, that's pretty cool that I've been able to do this. And aren't I, it's like that place of gratitude and humility to say, this is what it's about is I've allowed myself to have this level of of um, love and appreciation in my life. Not as a, wow, aren't I great, but wow, aren't I lucky? Or, Isn't this great in that I know the experience of making those shifts within myself does create the outcome of greater fulfillment within myself, which means I get to sit with you guys in Lubbock, Texas. It's the fulfillment of myself through that process. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Because it's like, yeah, the attachment's there. I'm, I'm excited about hanging out with you guys. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't make me special. It just makes me happy. So I don't know. That's all. It's, uh, it doesn't make me special. It makes me happy. Yes. That needs to be a bumper sticker, Rosie. You can start <laughs> selling that one on your website. Another marketing promotion. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, any other questions or thoughts? Because we're coming up to just a couple minutes left here. Um, what's the, what I like to ask is, what's the biggest takeaway from you guys? What did you hear that was valuable enough to consider or think about after, after I'm gone? Sorry, we've got a spider over here. It's taking the floor. <laughs> okay. He's not going to eat much. No, we just, we, we got to make him get outside. We don't want him to bite anybody. How big is the spider? <laughs> Tiny. <laughs> but it was in my skirt. So. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> it had to get out. Sorry. <laughs> So does anybody have any closing questions? Yes, Deborah, can you come closer? I would just say um, thanks for the reminders for all of those, for those of us that have been going through this for years or however long. Um, just having the reminders to keep us on track. And because life is a balance with family, work, kids, the whole bit. And I, just, I really appreciate hearing all this. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Asking, we're asking for takeaways. 
think for me, one of the things, um, I guess because it's confirming my own bias, <laughs> um, is what you had to say about uh, sitting with your discomfort. So, so much of what I've encountered in my training as a counselor is about how to, how to fix that, how to run away from that. And what I have seen over and over again with my clients is how powerful holding space is for them so that they can immerse themselves completely in that challenge, in that pain, and thus clear it and move through it. And so I, I appreciate hearing that from another professional. Yeah. Thank you. There's a, a, there's a book I highly recommend. You can't see what it is called because it, it, mine is all ripped up. It's the, but it's a, a book called Oneness, The Teachings by Rasha, R-A-S-H-A. -S -S -A. Uh, the book again is called Oneness. It, it kind of looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> a well-loved uh, well book. Um, it's one of the, the two books, this one in The Course in Miracles, which I, I uh, um, look at daily for inspiration and for incredible wisdom um, that helps sustain me um, moment to moment sometimes. Um, so really encourage you to find uh, supports, whether in books and people um, that can encourage and support you and inspire you in the direction that what you're wanting to go in. I always say I wish that I wrote Oneness because it's such a good book. I did write this book and the others I've shown you. This one's called Self Empowerment 101. And um, it talks about the fact that we, I believe we've really come here to empower ourselves to really live in our fullest capacity. We can't be empowered by, I, I empower people to empower themselves basically. No one can give you permission or say, go out and do it. You've got to empower yourself to do that yourself. And that's the, the the whole the whole sense of this book. If you see it, uh, if you go to Amazon or on my website, you'll see it's a yellow cover. It's got 101 on it. So just to, to say, but um, find those books and find those sources that are going to keep you uh, committed and uh, on track with with your intentions to live a so to live a fulfilled life. That's what I want for you guys. So. Thank you, Rosie. Okay. Thanks, Rosie. You're I'm welcome. So grateful for you. And you have a lovely day. And maybe we can do a joint thing with your group and our group sometime. Well, that would be lots of fun. That would that be lots of fun. All right. Well, blessings to you, dear. Blessings to you, too. Bye, you guys. Bye-bye.